Namaste yogis, welcome to the Happy Jack Yoga Podcast. We're so excited to be here today. I'm Happy Jack, coming at you live from Happy Jack Yoga headquarters in Muskoka, Ontario, Canada. And I'm here with... <laughs> You're here with Happy Hanna, who's also in Happy Jack Yoga headquarters in Muskoka, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> nice, yeah, it feels good to be home getting to hang out with my parents, seeing my brother, seeing my sister, all the nephews, and just kind of getting into a rhythm and a routine here. But we got a great show, a great conversation today, um, some great shares, we got an excellent question that came in, uh, and then certainly we'll we'll save some room for the, the hot seat. But actually one thing we were talking about, Hanna, uh, just before we got started here, it feels like, um, it's, we're, we're ready for something fresh, something new, you know, it's like we, we love what we're doing and and we've tried different things like we had the the busting the yoga myths and we've done the hot seat and you know different things like that taking questions. But it feels like we could, you know, to mix it up, try something different. So if anybody has any ideas, anybody here live with us, anybody listening on the podcast platforms, if you've seen what other great podcasters do and you're like, that's really cool. They should try it out on the Happy Jack Yoga podcast. Let us know and we'll give it a go, you know, just to, you know, be inspired by others. And because it's really, you know, we want to really the whole intention is to add value to all of you to, to create connection, to create community and to, to share something that's valuable. And I think there's something here. The fact that we got these these regular yogis that show up every week with us. We really appreciate you um, and we're committed to always getting better. So. Would you, would maybe, you agree, Hanna? I would. And maybe it's time to have a, a guest on the podcast. That's a great idea. In fact, well, yeah, we have, uh, we've got upcoming courses, new courses happening at Happy Jack Yoga University. And our intention is to, before we launch a new course, to bring in the guest <clears throat> that's going to be a part of creating that course. So that's a, that's a great point. Let's get that lined up. Um, and, you know, another, you know, Another big intention of this podcast is there's something about just like the accountability for us, Hanna, right? Like, the, you know, this means every week, every Tuesday, we got to get our stuff together. We got to get, you know, get get showered up. We got to do our hair. It took me a while this morning to get my hair done. Actually, it did. Hanna buzzed my hair so you can see it's freshly shaved. But no, really, it's there's there's some accountability of being able to come to this conversation and 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 be able to show up and hold space and that's that's why as yoga teachers you know as much as we we make a, an impact on others on our students there's something that we mutually receive as well that that kind of accountability having to show up for our class and and walk away um you know having grown having contributed and that's that's what this whole game is about yeah it's like i like what we often say that we're always a student and sometimes a teacher. And so both of us are, you know, an inquiry in the world, both academically and not. And then that keeps us kind of always fresh and ready to share what we've learned and discuss what we've learned and come together with everyone here and and explore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really, I feel... Again, sometimes it's busting myths or bringing clarity to what yoga really is. You know, last week, a week ago from today, Hanna, you were with me in Boston. You came to some of my courses, my classes at, at the Harvard Divinity School. And the one, the, the Yoga Sutras course, uh, you were there for about half of it. It was quite a long class. I'm not sure if you were there at the time, but the one thing that I really loved that came out of the discussion was that the Yoga Sutras, this classical yoga system, is very inclusive. So even having been written, having been written, you know, a thousand, you know, millennia ago, multiple millennia ago, um, it's still very inclusive. You know, there's nothing in the Yoga Sutras that says, in order to practice yoga, you must be this or you must do this. And, you know, frankly, this is at a time in, in the, you know, in the world when all religions, all spiritual traditions, all continents of the world, unfortunately, you know, things weren't so equal, whether it's uh, male, female, whether it's the hierarchy, social class, you know, there was a lot of inequality at the time, unfortunately. 
But what's really cool is that the, the yogic texts from thousands of years ago, in particular, the Yoga Sutras, um, makes it very clear that this practice, these principles, these virtues are available to everybody. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter if you're male or female, doesn't matter anything like that. I think that's pretty cool. It is. It's almost like a philosophy then. And yeah. philosophy is non-dogmatic or can be. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's completely a philosophy. Um, and, and there's just like such wisdom in it, you know, and another little insight I got, I'm just kind of riffing off that last yoga sutras course. You know, there's this, a very famous yoga sutra, chapter one, verse two, yogash chitta vritti narodaha. And basically saying that yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Or, you know, said more simply, you know, yoga is the, the stilling of the thoughts of the mind. And, and there was a, a distinction, though, in the, the commentary. So that's if we just look at the sutra, that's what it says. And, and so this is why we need teachers. Maybe this is going to tie into our question today. But this is one of the reasons that we need teachers in our life to help unpack these traditions is because in, in the commentary, it, it actually clarifies that you know, it's not so much about the stilling of the thoughts. It's about not identifying with the, the busyness of the mind, right? Because we have like, yes, for some of us, as we continue this yoga practice, you know, very, very small percentage of us will get to the point where, you know, we, we don't have any thoughts. We're in enlightenment and nirvana. You know, that's that's a, that's a stretch, but that's that is a goal. But for most of us, it's realizing, OK, we're not going to be able to turn these thoughts off but to be able to not identify with it, to not be attached by it, not, not get taken away in some story or some stressful thought, but recognize, okay, you know, I, I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. And maybe that's what enlightenment is. According to some traditions, enlightenment is not the cessations of thoughts and like a massive light bulb reality, but actually this reality that we are in already but our relationship with it is completely transformed. Yeah, that's, that's, I love that. And that's what a, what a cool path to be on. And who would have known, right? If, if we all, if every one of us think about the first time you stepped into a yoga class or the first time you took an online yoga practice on YouTube or however you begin, you know, and you get on, you get out your yoga mat and you do some inhales and some stretches you know, who would have known that it would lead us to some of these deeper truths and deeper, you know, possibilities within the tradition? Yeah, so or the uh, learning of this philosophy that we identified yoga to be, or even sometimes it, yoga is seen as a technology rather yeah. than a religion or a belief system, because you yeah. can apply it onto any belief system. It still yeah. works. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really important distinction is right. It doesn't, we don't have to join a club. We don't have to join a cult. We don't have to join a movement. We don't have to get initiated, come into our question soon. We don't have to have a guru. You know, it's like we can, we can be Christian, Muslim, non-theist, Buddhist, Hindu, anything spiritual, but not religious, multi-religious. We can be any of these different identifications or no identification and still apply yoga into our lives at, at a different level that at a, at a level that we feel comfortable with and and see how it changes us that's the that's the, the cool thing it's like you know it's, it's about personal transformation and and it's a lifelong progress like i know or a lifelong practice like i notice i'm still working on it you know just a thought that just popped into my head which is silly so now now i'm i'm all uh, self-conscious <laughs> because uh, our friend Brandon has been, you know, pulling out some really nice content and putting it out on social media. And I noticed like whenever, whenever he puts out a, a reel and, and if you're doing this speaking, Hanna, somehow, like I look at myself and I look like I'm, I don't know, either checked out or, or so I, I just recognize the importance of being fully present right you know in in every moment of the conversation not just when we're speaking but actually when we're we're receiving as well so i'm gonna i'm gonna do my best i do my best for 60 minutes to be fully present and attentive 
uh, and, and not get lost in my thoughts. Yeah. Coming back to that yoga sutra of stilling of the fluctuations of the mind and to active listening, like we were talking about today in the kitchen about listening, how um, listening to understand is different than listening and waiting to respond. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think, sorry to continue just the listening conversation that oftentimes in the trauma informed training and a lot of trainings that I lead when I, when we go into breakout rooms, we often try to, like, I try to remind everyone who goes into the breakout room to share with a friend, to listen, to understand, to really listen to the other person and, and I put a timer on, like you listen and the other one speaks and then you, you shift. And if you don't understand, you can ask deepening questions, but really to be there in order to understand the other person, not to sit there and like, oh, I'm going to say that to that point and oh, that to that point and just waiting for the other person to shut up basically. And then the question is afterwards, what does it feel like to be listened to in that way? Mm. What's the experience of being heard and understood? Yeah, it makes a difference. Mm. It really does make a difference. We, we got to witness that, Hanna, again last week, my last day of classes. You came to my ritual in the life cycle course with Diana Eck. And it was a very special class because this was her very last lecture. She's been a, she's been a, a professor at Harvard for 35 years. She's 79 years old, just retiring now. Like you got it better. She didn't do it for the money. She did it because she loves it. Right. And, and what was so impressive, at least for me, I'm not, I'd be curious to hear your experience. So this is her last lecture. All kinds of people came in like past students, colleagues, professors, you know, to really support this. And as she was leading her lecture, she was like speaking and, and sharing about each of the students in her course. In, in that class. So, you know, myself and all of the other students. And so there was like 30 plus students in there and she had something really meaningful to say. She knows us. In fact, she, she knew, knew she's like, she knew you. She's like, <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't even in the class. It was her <laughs> last class in the whole world and I had never been there. And, and that's because I have shared about our journey and our uncoupling. And I share, I actually shared with her the social media post where we announced it. And, and she was just like, so, uh, you know, pleased to see how we navigate it with, with such grace. And, and so she, yeah. Because a lot of endings don't seem to have a lot of rituals, like outside of death, maybe. <laughs> so That's I think right. that was the theme of that class possibly. Exactly. That's why it came up in class because we were talking about rituals and there's, you know, there's, there's many uh, marriage rituals and, initiation rituals and baptism rituals there's many rituals for beginnings but there's very few for endings you know other than funeral and so she was really you know kind of impressed to hear about this uncoupling ceremony but anyways you know just the fact that she remembered little stories that that i shared and every student in there shared like we it was just it touches our hearts like wow this teacher who is really quite famous, frankly, famous, yeah, probably you know, busy, <laughs> busy, you know, like, yeah, I mean, retired age, and the fact that she takes the time to get to know us, and, and, and make us feel seen and heard. And what was really cool was then, at the end of the class, you know, some people came up and started giving some, some just reflections about how they knew her. And there were, like, her colleagues who came in, and they're like, I was Diana's student in 1977. She was doing the same thing then. So you, if like, if we want to look for, you know, how, if we want to, you know, kind of look for the path, what are people doing to be able to create the life they have? Well, so here for half a century, this woman has been creating community. She's yeah. been listening and seeing people and bringing people together. And so I think that's why it's important for us as yoga teachers to, to think about that. How can we, how can we create that connection? And how can we be inclusive? How can we listen to understand that that person's reality? Also about what was clear in that class, in that final class to me was like, clearly the assignments had been quite personal throughout the whole course. 
and she had really listened to everyone and got to know everyone. And the way she wrapped up the learnings of that course was through everybody's participation and what she had learned from them is what she highlighted. So it wasn't just to be warm and cozy and make everybody feel, you know, seen, (laughs) but it was her way of tying all of the teachings together. What you as a group, there was more than 50 people, you as a group, what you learned as you went through the life cycles and rituals that were the theme of this course. It was really, really beautiful. Yeah. That's, uh, and again, I just, for us as yogis and yoga teachers and parents and, and different leadership capacities that we have, you know, thinking about how can we create that? How can we, you know, and it, it made such a difference. And, you know, I won't mention names of other teachers I've had and other professors who are great. Like they're, they're you could say they're world-class, but there's something different about Professor Diane Eck and, and other teachers like that. And, and, and many of the people here live with us right now, many of the people listening to the podcast because of the way that you share your story and the way that you show up, you know, it really makes a difference. And then it's not just about teaching and preaching rather it's about, it's about, you know, um, you know, just sharing vulnerably and, and being human and being relatable. And that's, yeah, that's the, our opportunity. Yeah. The collective experience of wisdom and, now that you talk about this, like the skills to create a space like that is going to be one of the courses that will lead later this year. And for the lack of better wording, we call it therapeutic skills for yoga teachers, but it's not meant to say that yoga is therapy, but just the ways that we, the the tools that are kind of maybe more subtle and less obvious, like we know as yoga teachers, we need to know alignment or um, how to speak Uh, yoga because you have to now tell people what to do without doing it yourself like there's so many tools we learn as yoga teachers but it's more rare that we discuss the more subtle opportunities that we have and and this is true for not just yoga teachers yoga is our vehicle that we the technology we use in happy jack yoga but it applies to any area of our life just like yeah. the yoga sutras do. And, and I want to do a shout out for the, this yoga therapy skills that not just the course, but the fact that you're, you're doing this right now. And I shout out to anybody. Some of you on this call uh, have had sessions with Hanna, but right now you're, you're, as you go through your certification, you've opened up a, a select number of spots at a highly discounted rate to do one-on-one yoga therapy sessions. And of course, I'm not present on any of the sessions that's confidential, but I see when you come down out of your office after them, like you're, you're so lit up and so fulfilled. It's like, oh my goodness, like I found, you know, it's like you've always been a yogi and a yoga teacher and a yoga educator, but now it's like you've further carved out your niche within the, within the, the, the possibility here. And Mm -hmm. so anybody who uh, would want to, it's, I mean, for, I just got to say for $50 $50 to get a one-on-one sessions, you know, send us an email at info at happy Jack, happy Jack yoga.com. And um, yeah, I think there's a few spots. Fantastic. It's such deep honor and so rewarding. And the most beautiful thing I've ever done. This is besides like having kids and doing all that navigation and and I have to say it's been so rewarding and now I'm quite busy with it. So, you know, it's it's I, I did not expect that. I thought maybe one or two people wanted to see me if I was lucky. But now it seems that um, it's working really well. And and the response seems really, really mind blowing and, and surprising to me, but also seems like people are getting something out of it. So I'm really grateful. Nice. Mm. Huge congrats to you. you. And, um, I, you know, I think, I think what would be good timing because we were just talking about, you know, um, my professors at Harvard Divinity School and Diana Eck, you know, we had an excellent question that came in, uh, and, and that, that Yogi happens to be here live with us. So we, we got permission to bring Felicia onto, the the spotlight so felicia thank you so much for being here 
before before we jump to your question, will you just you know give us a, a little thirty second uh, bio, who you are, how you found Happy Jack Yoga, what's your yoga, your hero, your yoga teacher been, uh, your journey been so far, uh, and then we'll come to your question. Alrighty, uh, so thanks for having me, um, bringing me on. I started with Happy Jack in what was it September twenty twenty two, so it's been about a year and a half. Um, I found Happy Jack Yoga through Sarah Beth Yoga. Um, so I was, I, I started doing yoga um, more heavily during the 2020 COVID um, pandemic. And I think like a lot of us, we were trying to find a way to manage the stress of it all and trying to find ways to take care of ourselves and all of that kind of stuff. So that was uh, what I started with was uh, doing Sarah Beth Yoga on YouTube. Um, and then after... After doing that for some time, for a few months, she started uh, sending out emails and putting at the end of her videos talking about Happy Jack Yoga and doing uh, your online certification. And I was like, huh, that's really interesting. So that's how I found Happy Jack Yoga. And um, honestly, I think I even found it like six months before I joined. It was I was very hesitant for some reason at the beginning, but now I'm all in and I love it. So I don't I don't know why I was hesitant, but I was. Um, so anyway, since um, since then, I have completed my 200 hour hero's journey. I completed the uh, 25 hour meditation course. I'm almost done with the trauma informed course. And I have a list of others that I want to finish off. Uh, so that's uh, kind of where I'm at in that journey. Um, getting into teaching has been a little bit difficult for me just because the area that I'm in is uh, not very yoga based. And so it, it, it kind of gets hard to get clientele where I'm at. Um, but right now I'm leading a meditation class on Wednesdays and I have a couple of individual yoga students who are interested in starting uh, classes with me. So I'm getting my foot in the door there. That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, we love having you in the community. We're so happy that, you know, after that six month discernment period that you you went for it, you joined. And um, I mean, Hanna was just when your question came in, you know, just this morning after we were getting as we were getting ready for the podcast, Hanna's like, yeah, like Felicia, she was great last week in the trauma informed yoga course and really participating. And so we appreciate your contributions and all that you do. And you came with a question. So do you want to uh, would you love to, you can either read what you sent us or just paraphrase. Uh, we'd love to take it on. Yeah, sure. So uh, last this past week, my fiance and I were talking about something and, and he either he or I referred to somebody as a guru. And we really thought about it for a second. And we were like, well, what does that word actually mean? Like, what is actually a guru? You know, because I think that we were using using it for like somebody in marketing, like it was like this, this person that's really good at marketing and like they know a lot and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I, I feel like that's very often used, like guru is very often used for somebody that just knows a lot about the topic. And when we looked it up, um, of course, Google is only going to give you what Google gives you, but it seemed like the, the root of the term is more spiritually based rather than being an expert in something. Um, so we were really just wondering about like what, what the root of the term is, uh, what maybe um, Sanskrit says it means or, you know, things like that. Uh, just kind of really understanding the term a little bit more and not using it in the wrong way. That's an excellent question. I love it. And something that I, I think about often myself. So I'll, um, let's, let's take that on. So essentially, I love that you're thinking about, well, what does it mean in Sanskrit? So, I mean, literally guru means remover of darkness. So that's a nice thought. You know, if you think we have, we have a heaviness, we have a darkness, we have confusion in our life. And so a guru um, literally means remover of darkness. And, and um, you're also, you know, correct to say that you know, a lot that? of like darkness yeah. can be also ignorance is also darkness mm -hmm. being in the dark of something. So, yes adding wisdom might be removing the darkness of ignorance. 
That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. And and you're you're right to say, Felicia, that a lot of people kind of throw that term around now in the Western world of like, oh, he's a marketing guru. He's uh, this guru or that guru. And, you know, I'm sure people can use the term and appropriate it in a way. And it's it's probably not harmful, um, but, you know, but really the the intention of a guru that's, you know, the word's been around for thousands of years is a, a spiritual teacher. You know, so somebody who's a spiritual guide, and that's that's where this whole remover of darkness, this, you know, somebody to, to lead us towards the light, whatever that happens to be. Um, and, and so we can have different gurus, we can have, you know, another another way to think of it is, yeah, spiritual teacher, we can have different teachers that we look to in our lives. Um, and there's there's different levels of different relationships we can have with gurus, like sometimes, there might just be somebody that we happen to follow on YouTube and they're a spiritual teacher and we might look to them as a guru like, you know, figure. Uh, and, but then there's also this this possibility to take what's called spiritual initiation. So like if if any of us, for example, if we ever were to find a tradition, find a path, find a philosophy, find a teacher that's like, you know what, this this just makes my heart sing. This feels right. This is what I want to dedicate my life to. You know, that's what some monks do in Buddhism or in, in, in different Indian traditions. And so then you can take this spiritual initiation and, and really give your life fully to the path. So that might be like the one end of the extreme, you could say. Most of us are not, you know, on that path. But, you know, so but we could look to people who are different spiritual teachers and they and they kind of model and represent what it is that we want to be, you know, because that's I think that's an important, important factor, because when that relationship of, you know, yogi and guru, um, there's a there's an element of surrender that comes to that. And so if we were ever to, you know, make that kind of high level decision, we'd want to really know in our heart, am I am I willing to give my life fully to this tradition, give my life life fully to this teacher? Um, you know, because it's a it's a it's a big decision that most of us are not going to, you know, we don't need to make. Yeah. And then in a spiritual context, that guru will be kind of your spiritual guide and kind of assumes the the responsibility of guiding your spiritual life. Yeah. Which maybe in other traditions, a priest could do or I don't know, really, but but it, it's kind of like a, it can be a, a, a spiritual relationship with yeah. a teacher who is maybe further down the path um, yeah. of that lineage. Yeah. And it's, I guess you could say it's tricky as well, because on the one side, we talked about a lot of these Westerners who are marketing gurus and, you know, all these different kind of gurus. So we kind of use the term loosely and, and then, and then also in, in some of these traditions, these traditions from the East and from the West, frankly, um, sometimes there have been gurus who have fallen down, right? So they, they're very charismatic. They're very uh, influential. They're very, you know, great at uh, bringing these people together, but then they turn out to, you know, do really bad things, really terrible things. So that's something we want to be aware of before we ever give ourselves. Yeah, I see Yonit celebrating. Yeah, we like really need to be aware of that. Um, and and that being said, though, as much as that is true, and as much as we need to take our time and not rush, and you know, truthfully, most of us are not, you know, on the path to choose a guru. Um, just because there have been spiritual teachers that have fallen, it doesn't mean that every spiritual teacher out there or every guru, therefore, is you know questionable. But the reality is, we're we're always dealing with humans. Right, that everybody's a human, and and none of us are perfect. We all have our own imperfections, um, and so just being aware of that, you know. So I think this might be more information that than you or others, you know, are need to be kind of contemplating at this stage of your yogic journey. But you kind of have that context. But I mean, ultimately, the the word in Sanskrit, it, well, another meaning for guru is heavy, and again, what that represents is like some just with like a, a depth. And, uh, and, uh, and, and also that remover of darkness, remover. So it's like being able to remove that weight that, and I, and I have friends that have taken, 
spiritual initiation. And they said, you know, our friend Wesley, who is part of the Bhagavad Gita course, and he said when he took his spiritual initiation 20 years ago, he felt this immense weight lifted off of his shoulders. That's not the case with everybody, but that was his experience. You know, he felt like, you know, he had quite a, quite a troubling upbringing and he was carrying so much and just somehow he felt this weight and this release. And, and he, in 20 years, he, he feels that he has chosen a guru and a spiritual teacher that has really led him in a, in a great direction. And um, yeah, so that's, I guess, different things to, to consider. But let's, let's bring you back on. Is there any follow-up thoughts, questions that came in from that? No, so what I'm, what I'm really understanding is that the guru is, uh, so it's, it's a couple of things. It's a spiritual guide, but it's also a who kind of helps to remove the forces of darkness. Is that so there's something about could your, the way your phone is set right now. We couldn't hear you. Somehow the mic is, yeah, so that say that again. Is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was just saying like, from, from what I'm understanding, the, uh, the guru is someone is, is a couple of things. So it's a spiritual guide, but also someone who kind of helps to remove like the source of darkness. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. So the literal translation is, is remover of darkness. So, okay. so okay. that's very kind of metaphorically fitting for what a spiritual guide does, but really okay. what it is, it's a spiritual guide. And, yeah. and, and every, there's no like one size fits all. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about no, like Hun and I are very different people. And, and she, if she, you know, I don't know, I want to speak for you, but like somebody you really look to is like Amma, who's a great teacher from Southern India. And so that's somebody that, you know, if you were ever to, you might, you might connect with her. I don't know. And she's mm -hmm. definitely a, considered as a guru by millions and millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. of people. And she's a special being. She's not your ordinary um, lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the kind of the point being that, you know, you, I would probably, I mean, I'm not, I'm not searching for a guru myself, but if you and I, Hanna, and probably all of us would choose somebody different in the sense that choose somebody that resonates with us, you know, and, the, and anybody that I've had this conversation with, because I guess, I don't know, I've been pretty deep in this spiritual path. So I do hear about it and people talk about it and, and kind of the good, the good suggestions I've had is like one, this, this really takes pressure off for me is that you don't have to figure it out in your mind. Oh, should I get a guru? Should I get initiated? Who should it be? They say like, you will know in your heart. So like, if we ever get, if we ever meet somebody, and we know in our heart, like, wow, this person is living it. They are so pure. They're so, I just, I, they embody everything that I would want to be. Um, you'll just like know in your heart and be like, you know what? I want to, I want, I want to take the next step in my relationship with this person as a teacher and, you know, become a disciple mm -hmm. or become a, a student of theirs. Or um, learn from them. It's kind of like falling in love. It comes from within the mm -hmm. whole it's there's like a magnetism um and yes all of the things that you're saying jack could be true that they embody all the principles that you're in inquiry around but also mm -hmm. a person doesn't have to get initiated to have deep respect and feel attracted to a, some very genuine spiritual teacher in order to have benefits <laughs> from their teachings but when you then commit to the path and there's probably going to be certain things that are asked of you then so mm -hmm. that your spiritual life would advance so mm -hmm. it goes kind exactly. of both ways exactly yeah and i mean that's part of you know for those who are on the visual i have my my mala bag of my my beads here that i i, I walk around Hunter and i were just out for a walk right before the podcast and i was chanting mantra on here and, and for certain paths, they will have, you know, requirements like that because it's, it's not something that's taken lightly. Uh, well, I, I should say there are some gurus out there who will just throw around and they'll take anybody and, and they'll just, you know, quickly here, here's your mantra, here's your initiation, here's your spiritual name, you know, but it's not so, and, and actually I don't want to criticize that, but it's more just like very accessible. Anybody can do it. And then there's other traditions like this bhakti yoga that I've been practicing a lot lately, 
where it, it requires, you know, quite a level of discipline, you know, chanting, uh, doing a certain amount of mantra meditation every day, you know, every day, not, not when you feel like it, but every day and, and living by these certain regulative principles, you know, by avoiding, uh, you know, you know, meat eating and intoxication and stuff like that. And so for some people, they might be like, okay, well, I've been doing this for some years and it seems to be having a positive impact on me. And I like the person who I'm becoming. And I found this teacher who really embodies this. And it's like, I got this one life or at least, well, actually we have many lives potentially, but anyways, in this one life, I, I feel like giving myself fully to this path. And, but to Hunna's point, we don't have to, and the reality is for majority of us, that's not going to be the case, right? We're, we're what's called householders, right? There's like monks. Well, I'm, I'm testing out right now for a short term, right? Shave my head, go to the ashram. But there's people who live that like for a lifetime. And then there's what's called the grihastas or householders, which is most of us here, which are, you know, having families, having relationships, maybe eventually having children, having jobs, having careers, starting a business. Um, but we can still practice. Uh, we can still practice yoga or bhakti yoga or these different principles. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there's those who haven't found it at all. But I get back to your point, Honda, like, yeah, we don't. I think I think it's important that we all go at a, at a pace and do what feels right for us, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't. And I just love the idea. It really took pressure off of me that we don't have to decide. Like, let's just keep immersing ourselves, like being in conversations like this. So thank you, Felicia for asking this question and, and getting, we get to have this dialogue and we all get to think like, okay, well, you know, what, what is important for me? Who, who do I look to, you know, certainly, and just to be clear, I mean, Hannah and I are no, not, you know, we're not at all, you know, in, in that kind of realm, like that when we talk, when we use the word guru, this is like, you know, somebody who's dedicated their entire life, you know, half a century to the spiritual path and that's all they live. Um, and then we can look to them for those principles, even though we're not living perhaps that same lifestyle, we, we look to them because they, they embody what it is, the, the, the qualities that we want to embrace. See, so yeah, that's great. It's an important question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thank you guys for uh, explaining and, and sharing with me about like your, your experiences with it too, that, uh, I think really helps me to understand and open open my eyes to um to exactly what um who who to or what to consider as a guru um because that that point that you've made there in the last uh sentence was not something that I had considered that you know it's somebody that has dedicated ha you know half a century their whole lives to to this practice to their spiritual being um, and that makes sense. That makes sense that that's the person that you would want to go to for guidance, not somebody that's been doing it for, say, 10 years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> actually, a distinction I can make, this is probably more than most of us need to know, but there's there's what's called a Diksha Guru and a Shiksha Guru. So a Diksha Guru with a D as in David, Diksha Guru, that's somebody that we would take spiritual initiation from. So that's that's like somebody who's living it, breathing it, like that's, that's somebody, not that we want to really put anybody on a pedestal, but like that's somebody that, okay, this person is a representative of what I want to become. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Shiksha Guru. So we would only have one Diksha Guru with the D. The Shiksha Guru are like teachers in our life and we can have many of those. Mm -hmm. So like anybody that's a teacher, Hanna can be a Shiksha guru for me because she teaches me a lot. She helps me see my blind spots and you know, anybody that's been a teacher, they can be in that way. But then there's this kind of initiating guru um, that's, you know, more significant relationship. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you don't, you know, for yourself, for your fiance, um, you know, you don't have to go out shopping. Um, you know, you'll kind of know in your heart. Oh yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, this is something Edwin Bryant, you know, he adamantly shares. And so he's been in our courses, like the yoga philosophy and spirituality course. He contributed to our Bhakti yoga course, our Bhagavad Gita course and our Krishna and Christ course and something. So he, and he speaks openly about this in 1978. He went to India and he found a guru 
and and it was a charismatic guru and it was a and and he spent some years in their presence and learned a lot and grew a lot and the individual ended up be, being a pedophile you know terrible mm. terrible terrible yes. circumstance and and that traumatized him and he speaks openly about this and so he's now very like he he's a you could say a shiksha guru to me a teacher to me and he's like you know he has that bias in the sense and he's like be really careful be really cautious if you're making a decision like this to choose a spiritual because because they're humans and and humans mm -hmm. make mistakes we can't we can't you know judge an entire tradition based on one human mistake whether mm -hmm. that's catholicism or christianity or bhakti mm -hmm. yoga or whatever it is the you know buddhism cuz there's examples in all of those traditions unfortunately mm -hmm. where people did terrible things but you know so the, the point getting back to professor edwin bryant what he says and he's like you know happy jack you know our text the shastra so the shastra means like the sacred texts they can be our guru you know until mm -hmm. until we really know because we we, we want to really know and hopefully not get traumatized like happened to professor edwin bryant which is rare but it happened um, you know, so he would say, look, let the texts, you know, keep showing up, taking the courses, surrounding yourself with good people, reading the sacred yogic texts. And if, and only if you like really know in your heart, um, then, mm -hmm. you know, then you can entertain that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I guess that's a lot of information coming back to, you know, the word guru, it's the remover of darkness. It's a spiritual teacher. So you're right, you know, anybody out there, and I mean, I guess I've never used the term, but I know lots of people who have kind of presented themselves as marketing gurus or coaching gurus or this guru. Yeah, I'm not going to judge that because it's a term and people, they know what it means. As you said, somebody who's really good at what they do, um, but it's, it's really intended to be a spiritual uh, teacher, mm -hmm. spiritual mentor. Mm -hmm. I like that. And our words have power. The words that we use have power. And I want to make sure that I'm using the right words when I'm saying it. So I really appreciate that explanation. And, you know, to me, um, and maybe somebody else can resonate the, with this. When While growing up, I was, um, you know, I went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, sometimes on Saturdays, like it, it was a thing. And um, our, I guess, a uh, person that we went to for any like spiritual uh, guidance and learnings and teachings was our preacher. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm relating it to there is, is the preacher is the person at the head of the congregation that is teaching the, the spiritual practices and meanings and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then in, in my uh, church, um, church experience, we also had uh, deacons, which were the elders of the church, the ones that um, if you couldn't speak to the, to the preacher, you would go speak to the deacons. Um, so it kind of seems similar in that aspect. That's great. That's, it's, it's really special that you've had those uh, different teachers, different, maybe you could say shiksha gurus, um, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. teachers that you could look, look up to, different mentors along the journey. Um, and, and that's what it's all about. Like I I appreciate though that you share that what you said was really great. You said that, you know, you want to, you said our words matter and what you say, what you articulate, what you speak to others, you want to make sure that we're in integrity. And I feel like I'm the same as well. Like, I feel like, you know, Hunt and I, we, we certainly do our best. We do our best and we're pleased with the work that we've done. And if I take a deep, you know, microscope on myself, I recognize that a lot of times I kind of, you know, Kind of take the teachings and make them my own which is which is okay but i want i want to do my best to to really make sure i'm passing it on as it's intended as it's said because it's it's kind of like that game have you guys played where everybody sits in a circle and, the, and you whisper a story into mm -hmm. somebody's ear and the next person tells the story and and by the time it gets around to the other end it's like a completely different story mm -hmm. right so we want to this is why we want to stay rooted in the texts so that's the other thing they say in in the yogic tradition is that a, a true guru right is not it's not it's not about them it's not about them but it's the fact that they they speak directly from the the ancient teachings right so they're just passing along they're a conduit um they're not they're not like oh a smart person or a charismatic person or a phd or knowledgeable like that's none of that is characteristic for guru but the mm -hmm. fact that they actually they're 
connected. I keep pointing this way because that's where all my books are. But the fact that they're connected to the texts, you know, to what the teachings say, and and that's what they share from, and that's what they live from. Mm-hmm. But I really appreciate you, Felicia, that you have this this uh, desire to to want to speak with integrity and to and to share things as they're intended. So a great question. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Amazing. Love it. Well, let's send, send the love high vibes to Felicia representing. Awesome. Awesome. You know, that actually, I, I just, I'll briefly share on you know, because it, it kind of ties in there um, with regards to the um, uh, yesterday, you remember this yesterday, Hannah, I had a, I got invited onto a Zoom call with Harvard Divinity School, totally out of the blue. And they're like, Jack, we need you on this. I was supposed to be there in person, but I'm like, sorry, I'm in Canada. And they said, okay, we well, got to join us in Zoom. So I get on the Zoom call yesterday at 10 a.m. And I found out that I was the recipient of some award um, for, it's because of my promise for ministry and in ministry defined very broadly, right? It's, you know, of course, I'm not becoming a preacher, a religious preacher, but ministry, you know, my ministry is yoga education. And so out of the, you know, 500 students at Harvard Divinity School, six of us were identified um, as having this, you know, great promise. The, the intro, the reason I wanted to share it, though, is what's kind of crazy is that this award, it's called the Edward Hopkins Award. And so this this person was born in the UK in the year 1600, 1600. And so, you know, and he was the governor of Connecticut for seven terms or something like that. And, um, you know, obviously did well for himself. And they've been giving out this award annually since 1728. So for 300 years, they've been giving, I just, it kind of blows my mind, like all these ages, this is older than Canada is, older than Finland is, right? So for hundreds of years, um, it's, it's quite a quite a history that they have. It's but quite I, an I honor to, to receive. Yeah, well, thank you. And the, I, but if I were to reflect on it, like I was thinking about it, like, why did I get picked? You know, all these students, all these really smart students, smarter than me, let's be honest, they're smarter than me. And, and also, you know, th- I would say they're more engaged because everybody knows my story where I kind of, I go in, I, I, I do what I need to do and I go out, right? Like I, I limit the amount of uh, time and commitment that I have. So I was like, why did they pick me? Because they, they said they consulted with the faculty, the teachers, the, you know, different people. And I'm like, why did I get nominated? And, and I think that probably if I think about the, the decision makers who chose I think it's positivity. You know, there's, you know, there's Pete, there's people who, I don't know if it's in, I don't want to say entitlement or uh, I don't know. Some people are just kind of complaining about stuff. Right. And I'm just like, I, I just see the good in every situation. I'm so grateful for every opportunity at school. And I just, I making these connections and and they see I'm enthusiastically learning and and receiving things in class and, and immediately sharing it with our students. And so I think it's like the positivity. And so I share that just in case that's helpful for others, you know, and it's, it seems to be how I'm wired because it, it, if we tie it in as well, Hannah, on the drive home uh, from Boston to, to here to Canada, j- just a few miles short of the Canadian border. Oh no, busted, busted by the cops, speeding, doing 80 and a 65. In Canada, you can do 15 over, but in the States, 15 over apparently is like a no-go. So I got, I got a ticket, but as much, I mean, of course it, it sucks. I'll, you know, I'll find out how much the price is when they mail it to me. But immediately I was like, I'm not going to suffer about this. Like, in fact, I feel gratitude because I feel, I feel like there's some divine higher power at work here. And maybe we avoided an accident Maybe, maybe, it, uh, you know, some, something was at play. If anything, it was a reminder for me to slow down because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a go, go, go kind of person. So it's like, okay, let's slow down and uh, slow down in life in all areas of life. Um, but I, I think that's, you know, I, I got lots of work to do in a lot of areas of life. You know that. But I think one thing that I'm pretty good at 
is finding the good in every situation and, and bringing that positivity. And I think that's why I was chosen for this ministerial promise. That's why you are happy, Jack. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> it's a result. It's a result of the yoga, though. It's I. I'm you, I think all of us were born inherently, you know, blissful, uh, and then and then we get conditioned by various things. Our parents do the best they can. Society does the best, but I think that this yoga practice helps us to reveal and, and be our best selves. Thank you for the kind words, Iona, in the chat. I really appreciate that. What are the words on the chat? Well, you, oh, you just, you just congratulations for the award nomination. Receive it like the immensely positive sign that it represents related to the work that you do. That's an amazing recognition. You've earned it. Uh, beautiful acknowledgement. Thank you very much, brother. And let's see. Oh my goodness, we're like. There's a couple more things I want to share, which means we might have to save a hot seat question because there's a couple other things that I thought were pretty good. Um, this pertains to to us, Hanna. You know, I got to meet with my therapist yesterday, and always, you know, I feel like I'm in an amazing space. I feel like you're in an amazing space. You know, so it was like nothing, no no challenges or anything. But just as I was sharing with her, kind of like my reflections on the on the evolution of our relationship. As I described it, she was able to help me identify there's some grief that I'm navigating. And so even though like I'm truly like so happy for you and there's like I'm I'm not jealous at all. Um, as as I see you, you know, spending more and more time or in communication with this new person that you're in relationship with, I see it's there's less time for us right naturally i mean what 10 years ago when you and i met we were on skype for hours every day right so i get it that now you know that you're you're in conversation with this person so much and and so, and so that means like less walking time you know now you go for a walk and a talk with that person instead of as much with me although we did have a nice one this morning um and so yeah my therapist was just helped me to identify there is like a low level grief here and it's not like traumatic or something because it's like it's all good it's all chosen i'm genuinely happy for you but it's kind of recognizing that the the relationship our relationship friendship that we've had for the past year and a half since we officially uncoupled is now again you know diverging in a way not in a negative way but just naturally in a distancing way to the point where now the main thing we have is co-creators of Happy Jack Yoga, which is amazing and something we'll always have, but kind of that, that chummy best friend relationship is, is becoming no longer naturally. So I thought yeah, that was good. Yeah, it's like another layer of our separation, the consequences of our separation kind of seem to like trickle in and I'm less available for you in the yeah. way that I used to be. And that it's understandable that, you know, it's something to process because we have spent many years together doing everything together. So it's completely understandable. And I felt that too. I also felt like, oh, this is another layer of, um, or another like consequence of us no longer being together in the same way that we were in the past. And I also enjoy our new relationship, which is, um, I think it works better for us when we get there. Like we're not hundred percent there yet, but when we do get there, I think we can do amazing things together as friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. And it's like, there's so much learning that comes from relationship that comes from life, you know, in, uh, you know, I, I just a quote I thought of, actually, I, I'm not going to really weave it in so well here, but a great quote uh, from Richard Rohr was that God comes to you disguised as life. So it's like we're out kind of seeking for divinity, seeking for God, looking for the signs. And it's actually it comes to us disguised as life. This is for me, this is one of my greatest teachers, the, the, the path that we're navigating right now. And, and the other great distinction that was really helpful that my therapist shared was um, that, you know, we're, we're unique. And so as, as we know, I like to be kind of very open and kind of share whatever's on my mind. And, 
And I found myself sometimes feeling like, oh, I, w- I wish you would tell me more, you know, and you've shared some about this person you've met and there's part of me wanting more. And, and, and Danya uh, has shared, you know, kind of like, well, okay, so you know how you are, um, but consider when, whenever you're making a request, you know, add in the words as much as you feel ready, right? Because we're all different and we're all unique and we all, you know, share things that in different, in our own, our own time. And I I think that was just good for me to recognize in every person in my life, whether I'm thinking about my parents or my siblings or, or, or it could be if we're talking with our students in community, right, not everybody is going to be like me, and not everybody's going to be like you, and just kind of waking up to that, and honoring that, and honoring and making sure in our communication, we're not like, you know, speaking for myself, making sure in my communication, I'm not like, setting an expectation uh, when, you know, everybody is unique. So I feel like it, for me, it was good learning. Yeah, I love that. Share as much as you feel ready is a, is a nice request, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really, exactly. So we'll, I'll keep you posted, get to meet, uh, just like you're doing great therapeutic work, Hanna, with some of the yogis live with us today with many other listeners. Um, it's, it's, it's important that you and I both as well have, have therapists in our lives and have these, these different teachers. The last thing I want to leave us with, um, so in, in one of our courses called Pranayama, Mantra, and Mudras, which is a great course, one of our most popular ones, the last term, mudras. So a mudra is like a, often like a hand gesture, you know, taking your index finger to your thumb, and it really brings intention to our yoga practice to our meditation practice. And I, and I heard, I heard recently um, a, a Bhakti Yogi talking about um, when, when we're at the ashram where, where I was living, you know, often we'll be chanting mantras and we'll throw our arms up in the air. And I did it and it, it, it feels good to like, you know, chant these mantras and throw my arms up in the air. And I just, I just did it out of, you know, following along with everybody else. But it was described to me that th- that's actually a mudra like throwing your arms up in the air. And we do that a lot in, in the Happy Jack Yoga, the Zoom calls, right? Throw your arms in the air, send some love to, you know, whoever it is. And, and the mudra, the meaning of the mudra is it's, it's a mudra of trusting. And I just thought that was great. You know, in, in a time where I'm like, I got these doubts and, I, and I'm kind of skeptical about things and in my head trying to figure things out, to do this mudra of like throwing our arms in the air uh, not necessarily surrendering, you know, to a guru necessarily, but just like surrendering to divinity, to universe and, and having having faith and having trust. So today I throw my arms in the air in this mudra of trusting that everything, not, not only that everything will work out, everything has worked out right now. It's like, it's like, we're so blessed. We get all these beautiful souls. We got Andrea, Brandon, Cassandra, Danica, Felicia, Ionat, Lorna, Sue. Thank you for being here with us on the, yeah, I love it. So Felicia's gonna go outside and lift her arms to the sky and how beautiful, you know, let's, let's inspire one another. So thank you for this great conversation. Um, again, if anybody has questions, send us an email, info at happyjackyoga.com. If you want a session with Hanna, get them while they last at this discounted rate uh, for a short period of time. And uh, we'll be back here next week. Until we until we meet again, make it an amazing rest of the day, our friends. Namaste. Namaste. Mm-hmm.